UFC Fight Night, Brendan Allen versus Chris Curtis, number two this weekend from the UFC Apex in the middleweight division. You get the rematch between the action man. Chris Curtis and Brendan all in Allen, where the winner of this fight really establishes themselves in the top five of the UFC's middleweight division. A huge opportunity for Chris Curtis to really jump the rankings. I believe he comes into this week with, I think, like ranked number 13 or 12. Brendan Allen ranked, I believe, number six or five. It is a huge spot for Chris Curtis and for Brendan Allen as well. It's a chance to right his wrongs. He lost to Chris Curtis in the original fight in 2021. It is Time for the rematch, and it's a chance again for both guys to really get in the top five here and establish themselves as one of the better names in the middleweight division. And folks, if you haven't yet, though, make sure to hit that subscribe button down below for some more UFC predictions here on the channel. Also, MMA predictions as well, because we'll be back tomorrow for PFL predictions with the heavyweights and the women's flyweights on the card for the first regular season show for the PFL. So let's get into the first fight of 13 on this card this weekend from the Apex. I mean... Gotta stick in the apex because the UFC loves saving money. Um, I'll make this um, just out right now. I'm doing this on Friday. I'm doing these predictions on Friday, March 29th, the night of Friday, March 29th. Um, just I'm, gotta get ahead on some stuff. So if anything changes to when this video is posted on Sunday, it is what it is. I will change. I will give you updates in the comment section down below or in the description down below on updated predictions if any fights change from now until Sunday. So also, I don't know what happened on the Aaron Blanchfield and um, Manafi card from Atlantic City. So it is what it is. Let's start this first fight here with uh, Melissa, Ta Melissa Tanya Mullins taking on Nora Canole in the Bantamweight division. This is a ranked fight. Yes, between Melissa Mullins and Nora Canal, the winner of this fight, will be ranked in the UFC's Bantamweight division um, with the females. Um, I believe M Melissa Mullins is currently ranked. Um, if I check the rankings, yeah, she's number 15. She is ranked, right? This is a women's Bantamweight division in the UFC that ranks Chelsea Chandler, uh, Josie Ann Nunez, who just lost to Chelsea Chandler. It is horrible, right? The UFC's Bantamweight division is bad. I mean, you can tell by the world champion. It's Raquel Pennington. Right? You've got Melissa Mullins, who has one fight in the UFC, and she's ranked in the division. She has one win over Irina Alexeva, where she beats her by unanimous decision. It is what it is, right? Alexeva actually drops her in that fight, right? Melissa Mullins wins. She goes out there and she out wrestles Irina Alexeva in the second two rounds to go on to win the fight. But the first round, she gets dropped and she loses, but she has to come back and wrestle her way to a victory. She's taken on Nora Canole, 34 years old, making her second appearance in the UFC. She's got a unanimous decision victory over Jocelyn Edwards, where she really just neutralized the game of Edwards on the feet on the ground she was getting beat don't get me wrong but in the striking range in the striking game Nora Canole was winning now that's where I'm a little bit concerned for Nora Canole in this fight if we're thinking about a prediction here I think she's gonna trouble she have a lot of trouble with the wrestling game out of Melissa Mullins because that's what Mullins brings right we talked about Mullins a couple weeks ago um, in her fight with uh, Daria Zelzanakova um, in Aries FC. It was the fight that actually got Mullins into the UFC. Uh, we talked about it because Zelzanakova just fought, right? And Daria goes in there, and she's the better striker between her and Mullins, but Mullins is able to get her down, and she's really able to do a lot of her best work down there, and she ends up winning the fight by TKO on the ground in the first round. And again, that's where I like Mullins a lot in this fight. It's going to be the ground game that is going to definitely stand down in this one. If Jocelyn Edwards found a lot of success on the ground with Nora Canole, I think Melissa Mullins is going to do the same exact thing. I mean, if Obviously, the odds kind of reflect that. You have minus 270 for Mullins in this fight. On the other side, you got plus 220 for Canal. So again, Mullins, the pretty sizable favorite in this fight against the French fighter. You got Mullins from England. You've got Canal from France. Again, this doesn't feel like a ranked feel like a ranked fight because, in all fairness. It's the first fight of, the, of an Apex card. It really shouldn't be a ranked fight, but that's kind of the direction the UFC's Bantamweight division for the women have has been going. Um, two fighters who are 1-0 in the UFC are fighting for a ranking, which is pretty ridiculous. However, I do think Melissa Tanya Mullins is the better fighter. I think her ground game is going to be far superior in this fight. I think she is going to be able to successfully get takedowns in this fight, and I think it's going to not be the, mo the most impressive fight because that's kind of just how some of these fights are. Um, I, don't know, I don't think it's going to be the most entertaining fight but Melissa Mullins is going to do a lot of her best work on the ground. I don't think Nora Canole has too many answers once the fight is at the mat. And I think Melissa Mullins is going to win a wrestling-heavy unanimous decision. So give me Melissa Mullins to stay in the rankings. Currently ranked number 15. She'll probably jump to 14 with the victory. It is what it is. She'll probably fight like Chelsea Chandler next. Anyways, on to our next one here. Two guys coming off the contender series. You got Dylan, you got Dylan Budka taking on the kickboxer Cesar Almeida. You might know Cesar Almeida well. 
because he does own a win over Alex Pereira. They kickboxed back in 2013. Yes, that is 11 years ago, but still he has a kickboxing decision victory over Alex Pereira. They did fight three times, twice in 2013. Pereira won the first, uh, Almeida won the second. They rematched for the trilogy fight in 2015. Alex Pereira ended up winning the fight by decision. Now, Almeida since then has gone to mixed martial arts. He tried it once in 2016. He won a fight by knockout in a minute and eight seconds. He went back to kickboxing, went back to glory for a couple years, came back in 2021 post-pandemic, won two fights against guys who weren't very good, went back to glory, fought some, and then got the call to the contender series. I was a little bit questionable in his contender series fight, right? I remember I talked about the fight when it happened at the time. When he fought Lucas Fernando, I thought Fernando was going to beat him. Almeida was able to keep the fight on the feet. And again, that's what that guy's able to do if he's able to strike with you. He did get taken down a couple times in that fight, but... That second round stuffs Almeida's takedowns. I know he gets pushed up back against the fence a lot in that fight. I mean, really gets stuck in some positions against uh, Fernando. But when Almeida is on the feet, he's a very effective striker. Now, for Dylan Budka, this is a guy who's going to come in here and he's going to try to wrestle, right? I have the limited fights I've seen Dylan Budka in, just because not all of them are all that, you know, recently, right? The last two fights that he has had on a contender series and a fight on SCS, you know, not the greatest, right? He wins a fight against a two and four guy, which isn't exactly what you want to see, you know, right before you come into the UFC. But I saw him in the contender series, right? I've seen a couple of his LFA fights. Um, the guy's a good wrestler, right? He's going to try to go in there. He's going to try to wrestle you. And that's where, again, Cesar Almeida is probably going to have trouble in this fight. It's a matter of if he can keep the fight standing against Bud Cup, right? Almeida is older. He's 36 years old. Again, he is the kickboxer. He's the former glory guy. If he's able to keep the fight standing with the mindless Hulk is Dylan Budka's nickname, he will win. If Budka can get takedowns and get them effectively and keep them on the keep that fight on the ground for the majority of the 15 minutes, then I do think Budka is able to win. It's really that simple. This is a stylistic matchup. And again, Budka, you know, I don't think his striking is the best, right? But that doesn't really matter because he's not going to try to strike with Cesar, Al Cesar Almeida. It does not make sense. Again, primary wrestler, though, he's probably going to try to go in there and just wrestle. I mean, he has to. He will lose the fight if he doesn't go in there and wrestle, um, right? So Bud Cut did get a shot for the LFA um, Interim Middleweight Championship back in 2023, so just last year. He ended up losing the fight by split decision, went the full full 25, ends up losing to Asmat Bekoev, who, you know, I, I think a guy who's definitely going to find himself in the UFC very quickly, probably will get a shot in the contender series. Again, he is, he ended up going on and beating Lucas Fernando for that middleweight championship. And yes, you heard the name Lucas Fernando. That's the guy who lost to Cesar Almeida, right? So you get all these guys who are kind of, you know, kind of intertwined in some some sort here, right? But I do think you're going to see Asmat Bekoev sometime in the UFC very shortly, at least on the contender series. Right, but Budka, I mean, if you want to play mixed martial arts math, this is stupid, but if you really want to play it, Budka lost to Bekoyev, Bekoyev beat Fernando, Almeida beat Fernando, so uh, actually it doesn't completely work. Disregard that, MMA math is stupid. Um, again, this fight comes down to, if you can think Almeida, if you think Almeida, Almeida can keep the fight standing against Budka, he's going to win. If Budka can get this fight on the ground, he should win. I haven't been the most impressed with Budka's level of competition. Again, he beat Chad uh, Hinkum in his last fight, a guy coming from South Africa who you know, fought some guys in Brave before he made his way to the Contender Series. It's not a bad win at all. Um, you know, you look at Almeida's win against Lucas Fernando. Again, Fernando, not especially known for his wrestling, so uh, I'm going to go with Dylan Budka to win the fight. I think Budka wins it by unanimous decision. I think he wrestles. I, I think he's going to give Almeida a real big, really big problems in the ground in this fight. Um, Almeida, for being a star kickboxer, doesn't hit the hardest necessarily, right? He is a good, you know, skillful kickboxer, but in terms of power, I don't especially think he, I mean, I think it's possible, but I wouldn't be too concerned about the one punch knockout power that Almeida can pull off against Budka. It's probably going to take a little bit of time for him. Um, just when you look at Almeida's fights, I know he's got knockouts, right? I get all that. I know he's got knockouts in mixed martial arts so far, but think of the guys he's beat by knockout. 0-0, oh, 0-0, no, oh, no, 5 and 28. Again, neither of these guys have fought the best competition outside of the UFC. They both have contender series wins. I'm going to ever so slightly, though, take Dylan Bud could have won the fight. We are going to play the favorite in this fight. Um, right now on Tapology, Almeida is a heavy favorite, but again, the betting odds show in Vegas shows that Bud Cut is a minus 120 favorite. I think it's a smart pick, honestly. I'm going to take Bud Cut to take it by unanimous decision using the wrestling. Let's go on to our next one here. Jean Matsumoto taking on, butchered that name, versus Dan Argan. So Arget is a guy who has had back-to-back -back weird fights in the UFC, I guess, right? He's 9-1 nine, nine professionally, 1-1-2 one, one, and two no contests so far in the UFC, right? You got the fight against Miles Johnson, his last one. It's a unanimous decision, but ends in a no contest, right? Um, 
And then you've got the Ronnie Lawrence fight where it's a premature stoppage where it's, you know, it, it is what it is, right? Argetta first comes um, to the UFC, right? Because of the ultimate fighter. Um, but um, but again, Argetta was the one who had Ronnie Lawrence in the choke and, you know, Keith Peterson stops the fight. He doesn't get his win money or whatnot. Was Argetta on his way to get the finish? I, I don't know, right? I just don't know. Um, it looked like it was good, but Ryan Lawrence didn't tap. I don't think it's it's a weird stoppage again. And then you look at the Miles Johns fight in his last one um, for Argetta. Again, it goes the full 15. Um, it is what it is, right? Argetta goes out there. Um, he loses the fight 30-27, but Miles Johns since then has popped. So... Yeah, I mean, Argetta, right? You go in there in the first round. He, I think he, does the, I think he does win the first round, loses the next two. I know some judges have the first round for Miles Johns. I think Argetta does take the first, and he loses the second two. Um, but now he gets a guy here in John Matsumoto, who's undefeated at 14-0 Brazilian. This guy who's been pretty hyped, I would say, to a certain extent, coming into the UFC, right? He won on his fight in the Contender Series against another undefeated fighter in Casey Tanner. He ends up beating Tanner by unanimous decision. Tanner's a guy coming out of fight ready over there in Arizona. Uh, but Matsumoto goes out there and you know does his does what he needs to do on the feet right Tanner's the one looking to engage in the wrestling game but Matsumoto keeps it standing and he ends up winning the fight pretty much by outstriking Tanner um and you know Matsumoto is not especially like the best finisher of fights he has he's only finished I think two fights since 20 2019 um which isn't the most ideal thing, but his two finishes do come with the guillotine choke. That is his go-to submission. Um, he gets Dan Argetta here, and Argetta, again, he'll mix it up everywhere, but primarily he will try to wrestle with you, right? You saw the Ryan Lawrence fight that he had the choke, but again, it gets stopped. Um, the Nick Aguirre win, he goes up there and takes Aguirre down and really holds him down there. Damon Jackson just kind of outscrambled him on the ground, outpaced him on the ground. We're going to talk about Damon Jackson in the co-main event of this card later. Um, but Argetta loses to Damon Jackson. He beats Nick Aguirre. He should have beat Ronnie Lawrence, kind of, in the Miles Johns fight. He, he loses, but it gets overturned. Um, it, it will be an interesting stylistic, stylistic fight here, but I think Matsumoto is better in keep the fight, keeping the fight standing. I think he will be able to keep Argetta. I think, I, I think his defensive wrestling is going to be better than Argetta's offensive wrestling. That's kind of how I'm trying to put this, right? I think Matsumoto will be able to keep the fight standing and on the feet, I do like him in a striking fight against Dan Argetta, right? When you look at the Miles Johns fight, again, he loses, it gets overturned, but he, you know, initially he does lose. Argetta wrestles in the first. The second round though, Johns wrestles in his own right. In the third round, Johns beats him on the feet and does take him down as well. I think you're gonna see something kind of like that, but more of a striking fight from Matsumoto here. And if he does go to the ground, I wouldn't be too concerned. Again, his jiu-jitsu is pretty good. It's just that his striking that's won in fights at least recently because he has fought wrestlers. I think that's kind of going to be the case in this fight because Argetta will look to wrestle. But I think Matsumoto wins this fight. I think he does it pretty handedly. I'm going to take him by decision. If Arqueta does come out with a really wrestling heavy game plan and Matsumoto does find himself again, Defending the takedown with the guillotine choke, he could end up pulling it off. This he could jump the ghillie like Dustin Poirier does, and he could he could actually finish the fight. Um, but I'm gonna take Matsumoto to win by decision. I think again he keeps the fight standing. I think he stuffs a lot of the takedowns and really just works from range. Ends up out punching Dan Argetta to a unanimous decision victory. Okay. On to our next one here. We have got a fight in the women's strawweight division. You have got Cynthia Calvillo. She returns yet again against Piera Rodriguez. Cynthia Calvillo, man, has just lost so many fights. She is on a five-fight losing streak. Her last win comes in a UFC main event back in 2020 against Jessica I. Yes, that was a main event of a fight night card back in the Apex. My goodness, this is one of the worst cards they pulled off. Co-main event probably should have been the main event. Marvin Vittori, Carl, Carl Roberson. But this card was horrible. Those 10 fights, it was bad, but it was just middle of the pandemic. And again, they were main eventing Jessica I. There is a real video on my channel that says, Jessica I versus Cynthia Calvillo uh, fight night predictions. It's ridiculous. Anyways, um, I think I actually took Jessica I to win the fight, but the Jessica I missed way. I, it was a whole thing. Anyways, um, Calvillo since the Jessica I win. She loses to Caitlin Kuchagin. She loses by knockout to Andrade. She gets stopped by Andrea Lee because she just said no mas at the end of the second round. Andrea Lee just beats her face in. She loses a split decision to Nina Nunes, who is more than washed up. And then she just lost a close fight against Lupi Godinez, who... I think Lupi Godinez at this point right now, again, this is me from Friday. I don't know what happened to Godinez against their fight um, with uh, Vina Janjihoba. I think at this point in time, Lupi Godinez was go is going to be a top five fighter because again, I, if she beats Janjihoba, she'll be in the top five. Hopefully I'm right, I don't know. But anyways, 
she keeps the fight actually competitive with Godinez. It wasn't one of Godinez's best performances, if I'm being honest with you, right? I was more impressed with Godinez's performances against Dakota and Tabitha Ricci and even Elise Reed, where she's able to get the finish. But Calvillo was probably Godinez's worst performance in a win so far in the UFC. Now, am I taking too much away from Cynthia Calvillo? Maybe I am just because I don't think Cynthia Calvillo is all that good. But when you go back and you rewatch that fight, no round is really like... It's not like, okay, Godinez definitely won that one, right? They're close rounds. I think Godinez won. But the fight is a lot closer than at least I thought I remembered it, right? And then Calvillo's fight against Nina Nunez, very close fight again. Nunez barely gets the decision. I I think, I don't know. I, go back and watch that fight. I think Calvillo maybe wins that. I think she gets two and three. I think Calvillo kind of got, I wouldn't say robbery, but I think Calvillo should have got the nod. The other fights I can't defend though. I, I'm not even like trying to prove a point here with Cynthia Calvillo, because I'll just be honest with you, I'm picking against her here. Um, I'm just saying, I don't think Calvillo's that bad, but she's not great anymore, right? Calvillo has always been kind of hyped by the UFC. They've tried to do that. I remember when they, oh God, was it Body Armor? I think it was, was it Body Armor? I don't know. They did a press conference at one point. I think it was Body Armor. I think it was the same one where they did a press conference. This is when the UFC was really high on Francis Ngannou and Hayden Stipe Miocic um, before their first fight. And they were hyping up, I believe like Kobe Bryant was there. John Anik was the, was the press announcer, right? And they bring out Francis Ngannou. They say, future heavyweight champion Francis Ngannou, which is ridiculous, right? And after that first Stipe fight and after the Derek Lewis fight, nobody thought that, that, would ever gonna, that was ever gonna happen for, with Francis Ngannou, right? But they, they, they bring out Ngannou like that. It was like, what? And I believe that's the same one they bring out Cynthia Calvillo for. And it's just weird. They've always tried to kind of push Calvillo. I remember they tried to push Calvillo, especially when they booked her in a co-main event against Joanne Calderwood. I believe it was in, was it in Argentina. I think it was in Argentina, right? It was in Glasgow. Okay, completely opposite side of the world. But they tried to book her in a co-main. They did book her in a co-main event against Joanne Wood. She wins it by unanimous decision. I remember they put her on, they put Calvillo on the big press conference. Was that, ew, I believe it was a Conor McGregor press conference. Was it not? No, Conor would have been gone by then. Uh, no, it was definitely Jones Cormier. They put her on the Jones Cormier press conference. And it was really weird. It was like, they're, they're, they're really trying to push Calvillo. But then she runs into Asparza. She loses. She wins a couple fights, right? She beats, she gets the draw against Marina Rodriguez. She beats Jessica I. You're thinking, okay, hype train is, hype, hype train is back. That's why they gave her Kuche again. But then she loses, then loses to Andrade, loses to Lee, loses to Nunes, loses to Godinez. I don't know. I haven't even talked about Pierre Rodriguez yet. Rodriguez lost her last fight to Jillian Robertson by armbar, but that's what Jillian Robertson kind of does to people, right? Pierre Rodriguez is going to look to wrestle Cynthia Calvillo. I know Calvillo, you know, kind of made her name kind of as a wrestler in the UFC. I just think Pierre Rodriguez is too strong for her. I think Rodriguez is just too physical. I'm going to take the Venezuelan fighter in this one because again, I think Pierre Rodriguez is able to just get on top of Calvillo and kind of just swarm her the entire fight. I still haven't picked a finish on this card. I don't think it comes right here. I think Calvillo will actually be competitive. I'm not going to lie to you. I think Calvillo will be competitive in this fight. Um, Godinez wasn't able to take down Calvillo, but she just, you know, settled for the striking game instead. Calvillo is usually the one trying to push the pace on the ground and try to get the fight down there. So I think that's why this fight will be competitive, but I think ultimately Pierre Rodriguez is going to do just enough. So I'm going to take Rodriguez to actually win a split decision here. I think it's going to be three straight split decision losses for Calvillo. It'll probably mark the end of her in the UFC. She'll probably, you'll probably see her pop up on Bellator next. Um, but if she keeps on fighting, because I think they would take her. Um, or actually, no, probably the PFL. She'd probably end up like, she, like seriously, Calvillo might end up as a replacement for the second fight of the, the 125 pound division this year for the PFL. I'm serious. Um, Pierre Rodriguez, though, is going to be Cynthia Calvillo. She will do it by unanimous decision. I do think, even though I think it's going to be difficult, I think she will be able to ground Calvillo and keep her down there and win the fight. Okay, on to our next one here. We've got even odds in the bandwidth division for Alatang Hey Lee Alatang. Yeah, he's going by that now instead of just Alat. Alatang Ali, yeah, uh, I think, right? I don't know. He's, the name's different now. It's the same guy, though. It's the Mongolian knight, Alatang. Alatang Ali, he's taking on Victor Hugo. Uh, Victor Hugo on a big winning streak coming over from Brazil, 24 and 4 professionally. The guy has not lost a fight since 2014. Um, the last win coming from uh, the Contender Series, where he ended up winning by knee bar in the second round. This guy is very talented on the ground. Victor Hugo is very good down there. I found it interesting that his nickname is Striker, but Hugo is a very good grappler. He's taken on Alatang A. Lee, and Alatang A. Lee is coming off a loss to Chris Gutierrez. Just tough matchmaking, man. I mean, I don't know why they gave him Gutierrez. Gutierrez does what he's supposed to do to him, beat the crap out of him by, his, by unanimous decision, right? But Alatang A. Lee before that, one back-to-back -back fights over Chad and Helliger, over Kevin Kroom. I'm still not high on Helliger. I know he beat, uh, oh God, um, the guy from Sarah Longo. I'm 
I'm losing his name. Uh, Gregorio. He beat Gregorio by unanimous decision, right? It, you know, Ann Helliger won a fight in the UFC. I'm still not all that high on Ann Helliger. I've never been high on Kevin Kroom. Kevin Kroom's out of the UFC at this point, right? Kroom's doing bare knuckle now. Um, like, all the time Lee's wins in the UFC still aren't the greatest, but he's lost to decent guys, right? He's lost to Casey Kenny, who... Does this guy fight anymore? I don't know. We have not seen him since the Song Yadong fight where he lost by split decision. He lost to Song Yadong and Dominic Cruz by split decision back to back, and he has not fought since. Uh, I'll tell you, Leo, the draw to Gustavo Lopez, but he lost to Kenny, lost to Gutierrez. He's got a loss to Kai Ascura back in Road FC. Kai Ascura is a guy who, like, at some point, the UFC has got to try to get this guy right. Like, at some point, I would think he's coming off a win over Juan Archuleta um, on New Year's Eve last year, right? Like, the UFC's got to try to get Ascura and Horiguchi, right? Like, they, they have to. Like, I know Dana, like, Dana's actually cool with Ryzen, so just bring him on over. I don't know. Anyways, uh, Tang Lee's losses aren't that bad. The problem is his wins aren't... They're against nobodies, right? And Victor Hugo, okay, right? Booked against Daniel Marcos in his first fight in the UFC, right? He's supposed to fight Marcos. I thought Marcos was going to be able to beat him because I thought Marcos was going to be able to keep the fight standing. And I thought Marcos was just all around better. Now, though, against Al Tang Hei Lee, it feels like kind of a step down from Marcos. It really does. Because, again, Daniel Marcos, very talented guy. He's undefeated in his own right. Him versus Hugo would have been really interesting, right? You're looking at that fight. Hugo is probably, a, you know... A, a two, plus 200 underdog, right? But again, Hugo has not lost since 2014. I do think his grappling is going to be enough to beat Alatang Ali. And I know a, not a lot of guys do take down Alatang Ali because Alatang Ali, for the most part, he's the one wrestling too. But I do think Hugo is able to be close in the striking game and then get the fight down. And I think that's where you eventually find the submission. This is the first finish on the card for me, Victor Hugo by first round submission. I think he's going to make a statement in this fight. You saw what he did in the contender. Again, Got a knee bar eventually in the second round, right? You saw takedowns in the first, but again, it was a second round submission for Hugo that won him the fight in that second round by knee bar. Um, I think the striking game's interesting, right? Um, I think Alatang Ali might be a little bit better on the feet, um, but he has been knocked out three times in his career, right? It's just, it's an odd fight. Both these guys, again, I st like, even though Alatang Ali's had seven fights in the UFC and he's four, two, and one. I'm still, I still don't know exactly what I'm going to get out of him because in his losses, he has been outmatched and in his wins, it's against guys who really shouldn't be in the promotion anymore. We will see where Victor Hugo stands and all of that, but I do think Victor Hugo's grappling is going to be too much. I'm going to take Hugo to win the fight by first round submission. To our next fight here, we go to the women's Bantamweight division. I thought this fight was going to be at Featherweight, if I'm being honest with you, but it's at Bantamweight. You've got the inaugural UFC Featherweight champion in the women's division, Jerrine Durandamy. She is back to take on Norma Dumont. I, I don't know how this fight came to be, but it is what it is. Jerrine Durandamy is back after a very long layoff. Her last fight came on Fight Island against a fighter who was fighting for the Bantamweight championship next in Juliana Pena, where she submitted Juliana Pena, who went on to submit... Amanda Nunes a couple fights later. Crazy stuff. That's how MMA works, right? But Drain Durandamy fought Juliana Pena. I thought Juliana Pena was actually going to beat Drain Durandamy. Didn't happen, right? I was, believe it or not, I was kind of high on Juliana Pena before a lot of people were. I don't, actually, I don't know if anyone's high on Juliana Pena right now. Um, but like, I, no, I didn't think she's going to beat Nunes, right? But I thought Juliana Pena was probably the number two in that weight class. I always, I kind of thought she was. I thought it was her and Holly Holm, right? I thought she was going to beat Drain Durandamy. And that second round, I'm like, okay, well, yeah, she's taking down Durandamy and she's holding her down. The third round, she's on her way to do so. She shoots for a takedown, goes for the single, gets caught in a guillotine, gets put to sleep by Drain Durandamy. Yeah, Drain Durandamy, first ever submission victory, chokes out Juliana Pena. But Pena came back, beat Sarah McMahon, and then got a title shot. Crazy stuff. Um, and she won, and now she's, you know, right now she's probably going to get another shot. I think she will beat Raquel Pennington whenever they do end up fighting, probably sometime this summer, right? Let's get the bell off for Quell Pennington. I, God, it's just, no, just get the bell off for Pennington. Someone will do it. If it's not Pena, it's going to be the winner of Kayla Harrison and uh, Holly Holm. Because uh, Holmes already beat your Quell Pennington twice. Um, and it'd be crazy if Kayla Harrison somehow walks her way right into winning the championship. But that's how weak the Bantamweight division is for the UFC. Because Durand Jerrine Durandamy is fighting Norma Dumont. And Norma Dumont is 6-2 and two in the UFC. But the problem is, who has she beat? at 135 pounds, because she usually fights 145. When's the last time Norma Dumont has fought 135 pounds in the UFC? 2020. 
I, I, I was prepared to say she hasn't. I actually forgot she fought Ashley Evan Smith back in 2020 and beat her by unanimous decision. This feels like a fight that didn't actually happen. I'll be honest. When did this fight? Okay, well, it makes sense. It's on Anthony Smith versus Devin Clark in a main event of a UFC fight night. Okay, yeah, so that's why I didn't remember that fight. Um, I truly did not. I like. I, I, I remember Norman Dumont versus Megan Anderson. I, not for the life of me could I remember Ashley Evan Smith versus Norman Dumont. Okay, anyways, for that fight at 135 pounds, Norman Dumont weighed 140. In her one fight, 135 pounds in the UFC. Outside of the UFC, did she fight 35? Okay, she fought 35 outside of the UFC when she was fighting in Jungle Fight and Shoot, though. But that's it. And that was back in 2017. Norma Dumont is a featherweight. She is a featherweight who's waiting for the featherweight division. I, for a long time, thought this was kind of the fight for Nunes because Norma Dumont's just beating everyone at 145 pounds. But then she lost to Macy Chasson. She comes back beats Danielle Wolf, who's 1-0, beats Carol Hosa, which is actually a good win, and then beats Chelsea Chandler. Now she gets Drain Duranemi. The problem is, what Drain Duranemi, I believe, what Drain Duranemi or Drain Duranemi are, are we going to get, which I believe she's coming off of a pregnancy, if I'm not mistaken, right? She had a child, I, I think so, yes. Um, okay, yes, Drain Duranemi and her girlfriend um, had a son. Anyways, that's great. Um, so Duran to me, um, yeah, so she's coming off having a kid. Um, yeah, I don't know what, and, okay, like, I'm not trying to be offensive here, legitimately. She was the one who birthed the child, so she was the one who was carrying the child, um, which I don't think is offensive at all to say, I just, I don't know, I, you know, what world we live in now, right? Um, I'm not saying, there's nothing wrong with this, by the way, no, nothing wrong with this. Um, anyway, I'm getting carried away. So Drainer and me was the one who did birth the child though, right? So it's different to the point where like, okay, they say Nunez, you know, had a child, but okay, technically, you know, it was Ansarov who had the kids. So, and, and Juliana Pena put this out there and she's not wrong by saying this too. Like she's the first champion who is a mother in the UFC because she actually had to go through pregnancy and whatnot. Um, again, I don't know any, I don't know much about, um, pregnancy or whatnot, but I know it takes a toll on the body. So Duran Duran me at 39 years old po post pregnancy is coming back to fight Norma Dumont. Okay. Um, okay. Hold on. I believe Duran is for the birth of child, right? Cause that's something I'm playing a big factor in this fight. Um, which again, yeah. Cause yeah, that's why she was out for so long. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. She was one who birthed the child. Okay. Um, oh God. Okay, this is a grappler versus striker because Norma Dumont is going to try to go in there and grapple. Drain Duranemi is obviously one of the better kickboxers the UFC honestly still does have, right? In this weight class, in this weight class. Um, Duranemi's usually been big for the weight class, right? She fought for, for the 45 championship a long time ago. She beat Holly Holm and she didn't want to fight Cyborg, so she just relinquished it. Re she just relinquished it. Um, English is hard sometimes. Um, but yeah, I don't know. This is grappler versus striker, and it's what are we gonna get out of Jerain Duran to me at 39 years old, a month away from being 40 post-pregnancy against Norma Dumont, who probably can't make 135 pounds. I'm picking Norma Dumont because I think Dumont's gonna miss weight. The fight's going to stay on, and she's gonna win the fight at catch weight 140 when Duran was trying to cut down 135 pounds, and Dumont just doesn't give a damn and weighs in at 140. I'm taking Dumont. She's gonna uh, lose 30% of her purse, but she's gonna win by unanimous decision because she's going to be able to take Duranemi down. And I don't think Duranemi really has too many, you know, once she's down, I think she's just kind of stuck. That's how Amanda Nunes beat her. That's how Juliana Pena was beating her. Drain Duranemi's not going to pull off a guillotine again. Norman Dumont's too good jujitsu wise to get caught in that. I can't believe I'm saying it, but Norman Dumont is going to win a fight over a former UFC champion. Norman Dumont's going to beat Duran Duranemi and she's going to do it by unanimous decision. Let's go on to our next one here. We've got the veterans, Alex Morono, taking on Court McGee. Court McGee, I, I don't know why. Did I get Mandela effect here? I thought he retired. I, I really thought he did, but apparently he didn't. He's back taking on Court McGee. Right, so, you know, or sorry, taking Alex Morono. Court McGee has been on the, you know, on the, the losing end of two back-to-back -back brutal knockouts, right? Losing to Matt Brown, losing to Jeremiah Wells. It's just been up and down for Court McGee in the UFC, if we're being honest, right? He's 10 and 11 in the promotion. Um, professionally, right record of 21 and 12. I'm just surprised he's still around because he's very chinny at this point. Sure, he did drop from his Brahimai back in 2022, which is probably his best striking moment in a while, but Court McGee gets dropped in almost every single fight he's in. Sean Brady got dropped. I know that's 2019, but still. Carlos Condit dropped him. Jeremiah Wells dropped him and knocked him out. And Matt Brown knocked him out at 40, what, 41 years old. 
Morono is kind of a part-time fighter, right? He is the guy, he is the coach of Fortis MMA, um, right? Um, and wait, oh, he's, he's, he's Fortis and he's uh, Gracie Baja. Does he coach at Fortis or he's just coach Gracie Baja? I think he just coaches at Gracie Baja, I think. I believe so. Um, anyways, he's primarily just a coach at this point, right? But he fought Joaquin Buckley in his last fight, lost to, unanim lost to him by unanimous decision, pulled off his submission victory before that against Tim Means, and then lost the fight where he got knocked out against Santiago Ponzinibbio back in 2022. Uh, I believe that fight was on short notice to a certain extent. I think Morono took that fight on short notice. Um, okay, I just think, I think Morono's hands are gonna be too much for Court McGee in this fight. McGee will try to wrestle, that's what he does. Morono, I think, is good enough defensively to keep the fight standing. I don't think, I just, Court McGee is just so old. He's 39 and he's had so many fights. He's been knocked out twice, back-to-back -back years at this age, it just comes to a point where maybe you shouldn't be fighting anymore. And I hate to say it, but Court McGee's at that point where he shouldn't be fighting anymore. Alex Morono does not have the heaviest hands. He truly doesn't. The last time Morono won a fight by knockout, it's Cowboy Cerrone, who probably shouldn't have been fighting at that point in time, but he knocked out Cowboy TKO'd him on the feet back in 2021. He didn't even finish Mickey Gall on the feet. But Court McGee's chin's gone. Alex Morono's gonna chin him. How does McGee win? He gets Morono down. He just holds him on the ground. I don't think that's gonna happen. I think Morono's defensive wrestling and jujitsu is good enough to get him out of that point, uh, get him out of those spots. Morono should win. This feels like a pretty easy pick here, right? Again, Morono, not the most, well, he's actually been kind of active. Um, again, Fighting, honestly, I believe is second for Alex Morono at this point in time. Like, I think his main priority is coaching. Um, but Morono, again, I think he's able to get Court, get court McGee um, on the feet. I don't think McGee's able to take him down. So this fight ends up as a standing fight. And when this fight's going to be standing, Alex Morono is going to do work on the feet against Court McGee. McGee's striking. He is slow on the feet at this point. And just technically sound, Morono's better. He's faster. Morono's going to beat, beat him to the punch every single time. Alex Morono wins this fight pretty decisively by first round knockout. I uh, don't have much else to say because I just think it's a mismatch uh, at this point in their careers, right? On to our next one here, Trevor Peak taking on Charlie Campbell. Uh, someone's getting knocked out in this one, and it should be good. There's a reason this one's opening the main card, even though, yes, it is, it is in the apex, but there's a reason this fight has the spot on the card that it does, right? It's over Morono, Court McGee. It's over Dumont, Durand, me. There's a reason it's here, because someone's probably going to sleep. This is going to be fun. Charlie Campbell's coming off a win over Alex Reyes. That's probably one of the worst first wins you can get. Not performance-based, but just that Alex Reyes hadn't fought in six years, and Charlie Campbell beat him by knockout in the first round at UFC Noche, right? DC gives him the mic, say what you want to say. Charlie Campbell says, it doesn't matter what you think DC tries to drop the whole Dwayne Johnson thing on him. Maybe he'll call himself the final boss while he's at it. Maybe he'll, uh, you know, take shots at Cody Rhodes' mother while he's at it too. Um, but anyways, Campbell, right, knocks out Alex Reyes. Exactly what he's supposed to do. I, I don't think the highest of Charlie Campbell though, right? Uh, he beats Reyes, right? He wins that fight. But the fight before that, right, he beats a guy in CFFC who's 9-5. And, and then he loses to Chris Duncan before that on the Contender Series. He's getting Trevor Peak now. And I think Peak, Peak is very playable here at plus 170. I didn't really know if he was going to beat Muhammad Yaya in his last fight. I thought he was going to lose, actually. Goes out there, ends up winning the fight by decision. He loses to Shepe Mariscal, who we're going to talk about in a minute here. He's going to be fighting Morgan Shiree later on in this card. And I think Mariscal's decent, but Peak ended up losing the fight by decision. No shame in that. Peak's first win in the UFC. Not a great name. Eric Gonzalez, a guy who constantly got knocked out in the UFC. He ended up knocking him out in the first with the second left, even though Trevor Peak, oh my goodness, this guy leaves his chin wide up in the air. And he does not give a damn if he gets hit a million times. That's how Trevor Peak fights. Chin wide up in the air. He is going to throw bombs and he is going to try to knock you out. Now, Mariscal wasn't able to finish him. Mariscal did take him down, look good with the wrestling. Will Charlie Campbell look to wrestle? I don't think so. I think you're going to see primarily a striking fight. So who is the better striker in this one? Is it Peak or is it Campbell? I think technically sound yet, Charlie Campbell is better. I think that's why Charlie Campbell does open as the favorite right now. I think it is because Trevor Peak has a lot of holes in his game. He will blitz, he will go for it, but I think Campbell can really exploit a lot of the things Trevor Peak does. I like Trevor Peak, but I think against a better striker, he's going to lose, and this is the better striker in Charlie Campbell. I don't think Campbell's the greatest, but I do think you see somewhat of Trevor Peak just going for it and blitzing a lot in these spots and just leaving himself wide open to be hit, and that's where Campbell is going to you know, pick his shots, and that's where Campbell is going to set him down and knock him out. We'll see how good Charlie Campbell truly is, though, because, again, a win over Alex Reyes, Reyes doesn't really dictate much, um, but I do think he's better than Trevor Peak. 
I think Pika has more power, don't get me wrong, but I think precision beats power. I'm not saying Troy Campbell is the most precise striker ever, right? I'm really not. I just think in this spot, stylistically, he matches up pretty well with Trevor Peak, just because Peak is there to get hit a lot. And I don't see Peak going back to a decision. I think that's, you know, that's an outlier in the Muhammad Yaya fight back at UFC 294. I think Campbell is going to pick him apart. I think Campbell will win this fight by first round knockout. I think his volume is going to be too much. And again, I think Peak is just going to leave himself exposed to being hit. So give me Charlie Campbell to win the fight by first round knockout. Going on to our next one, UFC debut here for the heavyweight Walter Walker coming out of Brazil, originally um, or fighting out of Russia, but he is Brazilian, taking on a UFC fighter who is 0-3 in Lucas Brezki. I think you know where this is going. This is setting up for a Walter Walker victory, right? Obviously, he's undefeated. He's 11-0. The guy's pretty decent. He is coming off a win over Alex Nicholson, right? So Nicholson has been in and out of PFL, bare knuckle, whatnot, right? You know, his last fight, he lost on bare knuckle, game bread at FC MMA or game bread MMA against Chase Sherman. He got finished in the first round, right? But Alex Nicholson's last MMA fight was a five round fight for the Titan FC heavyweight championship where Walter Walker ended up finishing him. Basically Nicholson quit in the fourth round. Walker is good. I think he's got a lot of holes that are going to be, you know, exploited or, you know, I think, I think eventually as he makes his way up the ranks, he's going to lose. My thing is right now against Lucas Brezky, he's not going to lose. Brezky's not very good. He's really not. Now, did he beat Martin Budai? I think I talk about this every time either Budai or Brezky fight. I think Brezky probably could have won that fight. Maybe he should have got the nod. Since then, though, he hasn't looked very good. Carl Williams dominated. But Carl Williams, you know, maybe he'll get his cook off against Stipe Miocic someday, um, as he called him out after his last fight. But Carl Williams, you know, he wrestles. That's what he does. But you look at the Wado Cortez Acosta fight, right? Cortez Acosta is beating Brezky to the punch. He knocks out Brezky in that first round. Um... So maybe Brezky's record isn't really as bad as it looks, right? Because Brezky, more of a volume guy on the feet at heavyweight. He's a guy that's going to try to overwhelm, overwhelm, you, overwhelm you with strikes. And he's a guy that's trying to get the, to the full 15 and win a decision. That's kind of how I see Brezky, especially at this level against these guys. I don't think he has the, the potential to really knock out a lot of these guys. I think what he's trying to do primarily and what he has to do in a fight with a guy like Walter Walker is just win moments on the feet and win rounds. However, I don't think he's going to be able to do that because Walker is going to close the distance and Walter Walker is going to knock him out. If he doesn't do that, he's going to take him down. He's going to give him hell on the ground because Walter Walker's ground pad is good too. He can get takedowns if he has to. And he's just good on the ground. Not great on the ground, but better than what I think Brezky is, right? I, I haven't seen Brezky's ground game. He really, other than the Carl Williams fight, he looked kind of lost in the fact on the ground against Carl Williams. But in all fairness, a lot of guys are going to look lost in the ground against Carl Williams, like what Williams did to Justin Taffa, right? Um, now for Carl Williams, he has to shoot takedowns against guys before he gets wobbled on the feet, right? Like Justin Taffa should, had no business being in that fight. If Carl Williams straight, straight up starts looking for takedowns at the beginning of the round, he wins. But instead, he waited till Taffa hit him with something big, and that's when Williams went, oh crap, I gotta wrestle now. And he still ended up winning the fight, but if Carl Williams just went out there, I know it's not great to watch, it's kind of boring, I'll be honest, but if Carl Williams just went in there and straight up wrestled guys, UFC would hate him, they would. They would. He, he'd get treated like Justin Willis out there. They hate him, they wouldn't want him around, but he wouldn't fight, because a lot of these heavyweights cannot wrestle. Like, other, like if you're not Curtis Blades, or you're not Johnny Tonomeda, or you're not like Volkov, or the top guys, like John Jones, Aspinall, Tybora, you can't wrestle. All these guys suck at wrestling. Um, just a heavyweight. It's just not a very skillful division, if we're being honest. Anyways, Walter Walker is going to mop the floor with Lucas Brezky. This one isn't close. Walter Walker, first round knockout. He's got more power on the feet. Brezky, again, I'm not impressed uh, with his performance uh, performances. Um, I just don't think his striking game is all that great. I'm going to take Walter Walker to just dominate the power. Discrepancy is going to be huge in this one. Walker's the all-around better striker. He's going to win this fight by first round knockout. To our next one here. Big favorite in this fight, of course, in the lightweight division. We've got the Chilean fighter, Ignacio Bahamondes, taking on Christos Yagos. I feel like they do this a lot with Yagos, right? They just put him in fights where they think guys are going to be really good in the future. So they say, all right. Don't fight Chris Jos Yagos. They did that with Sarukyan. They did that with Thiago Moises, but Moises is a more established guy at that point. But they did that with Sarukyan. They did that with Daniel Zell Huber, right? I feel like that's kind of what they're doing here with Ignacio Bahamondes, if I'm being honest here. Um, again, the odds kind of indicate where this fight is probably going to go, if we're being honest, when you just look at it. Um, but Bahamondes should be Chris Jos Yagos. 
right? Baham Ornes is coming off a loss, right? He's coming off a loss to Ludovic Klein. He loses it by unanimous decision, right? Klein beats him to the punch every single time, and Klein does go down there and wrestle with him. Um, well, Chris Josiagos looked to exploit him on the ground, which I think that's a part of Baham Ornes' game, which is kind of lacking, right? Because, like, Rong Zhu took him down. I know Baham Ornes ended up getting the submission with the guillotine, but still, right? Like, guys are able to take Baham Ornes down if they really go for it, I think. I think better wrestlers, I'm, I'm not talking about like lower level guys, better wrestlers like Ludovic Klein will be able to take down someone like Ignacio, Ignacio Bahamondes. Ignacio Do I think Diagos is that guy though? No, Diagos really isn't the best grappler. He's more of a striker, right? Um, but when you look at Diagos, right, he's lost three out of four. His only win is Ricky Glenn, where like he's supposed to knock out Ricky Glenn. Um, you know, he lost to Daniel Zell Huber. Zell Huber submitted him. Thiago Moises submitted him. Srukia knocked him out. This feels like a fight that, again, Yagos is a stepping stone to Ignacio Bahamondes. The thing is, Bahamondes is not like the straight up first round finisher, though. It takes Bahamondes some time to get finishes. Um, so I'm taking Bahamondes. I'll just be honest. I'm taking Bahamondes. I'm going to take him by second round knockout. I think, again, it just takes Bahamondes some time to download everything that his opponent gives him basically on the feet, take it all into account, and then look to get the finish eventually, right? Bahamon is a very long fighter from 155. Um, he's gonna have about a five inch reach advantage over Yagos in this one. He's 6'3", Yagos is 5'10". Again, Bahamon is huge for the weight class. So if he uses that reach to his advantage, again, he just uses his kicks effectively, stays at range. He's gonna make it real hard for Yagos to try to close distance and try to get off any close shots. And that's kind of where Ignacio Bahamondes is going to dictate where this fight ends up and dictate really the pacing of this fight as well. Bahamones should be able to win this fight, I think, on the feet. Um, I'd be surprised if he doesn't. I think, again, Bahamones is still figuring things out in his mixed martial arts career because he's only 26, right? He comes in the UFC at a very young age. The guy's only 26 years old. Um, Again, this guy will probably end up being a 170 pounder at some point, I would think, in the UFC. But right now, again, I think he's able to go beat Christos Yagos. I think his striking game is all around better than Yagos. Um, yeah, I, I just, I don't know where Yagos wins. And I've seen this a lot where Christos Yagos loses to a guy the UFC is trying to build, um, primarily a prospect. And yeah, it just feels like a fight Ignacio Bahamondes has to win. I think he's going to do so. So give me Bahamondes by second round at TKO. I think, it, think it, I think it takes him a little bit of time, but eventually he will go out there and get that finish. On to our next one. Morgan Shiree, the French-born fighter, takes on Chepe Mariscal. For Chepe Mariscal, right? 2-0 in the UFC. Um... The last fight against Jack Jenkins, though, is the weird, you know, Jenkins hurts his arm, right? Um, God, what was it? Google Plata, I believe, right? I think it was Google Plata, I think. I think. He, he was in a submission. He breaks his arm. He's trying to get out on the ground, and he just broke his arm, right? Um, it is what it is. It's a verbal tap out. Merit Scott wins the fight. Before that, he beats Trevor Peak by unanimous decision. Because, uh, again, we talked about Peak earlier. There's a lot of holes in Peak's game. Merit Scott was able to exploit that on the feet and both on the ground. He's able to get peek down and win in moments in that fight. Um, but Mariscal, again, has been really effective on the ground so far in the UFC. That's what he's been able to do, right, to guys. He was competitive on the feet against Jack Jenkins. I thought Jenkins was probably going to beat him in that fight because Jenkins did win the first, but again, it happened in the, the injury happened in the second round, so you end up losing the fight. Um, but I think Jenkins was probably on his way to win that one. They're now giving Mariscal Morgan Shiree in this one for Shiree. This is a guy who beat Manolo uh, Zicheni in his last fight. Zicheni's, I, I don't think he's very good, right? It was a weird signing. It just felt like a fight. Okay, we're in France. Give Shiree a victory, and that's what happened. Shiree was a minus 345 favorite in that fight. But again, this is a guy coming over from Cage Warriors. He's very good, right? I mean, he lost to Paul Hughes for the belt, uh, for the interim belt back in 2021. Ended up losing the actual belt back in 2021 as well. So he dropped back-to-back -back fights, but really, again, has come up, come into his own. Ended up winning a couple fights and getting the UFC. He's 28 years old, right? So again, he did all that work in, in, in Cage Warriors at a pretty young age, and he's won fights since then. Um, but Shiree is good. Again, you look at his last fight, the body kicks end up getting him the knockout or the TKO finish, right? He's able just to go out there and really work the entire game. He's an all-around very good kickboxer is Morgan Shiree, right? The loss is both very close decisions to uh, to those to the two guys he lost to in, uh, the, in Cage Warriors, Paul Hughes, and uh, he lost to... He lost to lost to another guy by a uh, split decision uh or jordan Vuch, vuchnich i believe um by split decision right so like all of shari's losses have been close 
but this is a all around very good striker, a guy that has only been finished once by submission ever, right? I don't think Mariscal's able to get that stoppage on the ground. I don't think so. Morgan Shiree should be able to keep this fight standing, and he's going to have, I think, a lot of success against Mariscal in this fight. I feel like this is somewhat of a levels fight. I think Mariscal is decent, but I think at 2-0, he's not on that same level as another undefeated UFC fighter, or another fighter who's undefeated in the UFC in Morgan Shirey. Just the, the stand-up game is going to do wonders for the last pirate in this fight. Um, I think Shirey wins. You look at the odds in this one. Shirey a minus 150 favorite, Mariscal plus 125. You look at topology, 60% going with Mariscal, 40% going with Morgan at Shirey. I'm taking Shirey to win the fight by second round TKO. I think eventually, again, that all-around work that Shirey pulls off is going to be enough and i think it's going to be an accumulation of damage that eventually pulls off the victory for morgan shiley in this fight um taking the french born fighter i think pretty highly this guy um cage warriors has produced some good guys um right they've produced some reese mckees too which don't know what happened in the reese mckee versus chitty and jokawani fight just yet but right cage warriors has been a decent promotion for the ufc I just don't think all that highly of Mariscal still with his two wins, right? It was still, I remember when he got signed, it was weird, right? Because yeah, he was the LFA, he was an LFA champion, but he ended up winning an LFA main event and then getting signed immediately to the, to the UFC. But like, he lost three out of four in 2020 to Joe Anderson Brithu, ended up winning a fight, lost to Steve Garcia and lost to Sean Soriano. Yeah, all three of, these, three of those guys he lost to are UFC names, but it was just like, he lost to those guys. He beat Yusuf Zalal back in 2019, but that was before Zalal's first UFC run. Yeah, I think Shiree wins the fight. We're going to take him by second round at TKO. On to the co-main event. We have got Anthony, not Alexander Hernandez. Anthony, Anthony Hernandez is going to be fighting Roman Delidze later this year. But we got Alexander Hernandez taking on Damon Jackson. Two guys who have both lost to Billy Corintillo. Um, but Corintillo just lost Yusuf Zalal, so it is what it is. Um, but yeah, Hernandez and Jackson going out in this fight, right? Both these guys coming off losses. They both find themselves in a co-main event spot after losing because that's just kind of what happens with the UFC Apex. Um, but Jackson's lost two straight, right, to the likes of Corintillo and to Dan Ige. Ige finished him in the second round. Corintillo was able to keep him standing and just outboxed him. And that's kind of what you have to do against Damon Jackson, right? Damon Jackson, good grappler, right? Really good jiu-jitsu guy. If he gets you down there, he is going to give you trouble. On the feet, though, again, leaves a lot to be desired. And that's where Alexander Hernandez does have a huge advantage in this fight. And now, again... Damon Jackson lost two out of, or he's lost the last two fights. Alexander Hernandez has lost three out of four. His win is Jim Miller by unanimous decision. Lost to Bill Algio, lost to Billy Corintillo by TKO. Got choked out by Hanato Moicano, it happens. Before that, beat Mike Breeden, but Breeden didn't really deserve to be in the UFC. And then lost to Thiago Moises before that. Beat, beat Chris Gritzmacher before that, lost to Drew, Drew Dober. Beats Francisco Trinaldo in a horrible fight in San Antonio. I think it was in San Antonio. Um, right, Hernandez beats a lot of these guys. He's above, obviously, like again, Gritzmacher, Breeden, Gritzmacher and Breeden were well below him and, you know, just as a fighter skillfully. Jim Miller, I, I thought Jim Miller was going to beat Alexander Hernandez, I'll be honest with you. He didn't, right? Like, Hernandez did actually go out there and win that fight. Miller just got outpaced in every single round, and that's kind of why I think Bobby Green's going to be Jim Miller. As long as he doesn't get chinned, we'll see at UFC 300, though, we're going to talk about that fight, I guess, next week now, which is crazy. UFC 300's that um, close. Um... But yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think Hernandez is able to keep J keep Jackson standing in this one. Um, if Damon Jackson not able to, not able to get a takedown, he's going to be in hell. He will be in hell in this fight if he cannot take down Hernandez. Just because, again, Hernandez, when he fights guys who are lower level of grapplers or lower level of strikers, he gives them problems. Because, yeah, Hernandez will beat up on some of these guys. Right, and it just feels like this is kind of how this fight goes. I think Hernandez is able to get, get himself out of spots too on the ground with Damon Jackson, right? Like if Jackson does take him down, I think Hernandez can get out of some you know spots where Jackson's looking to take his back. I think Hernandez is decent enough in transitions and in scrambles on the ground where I think he can use his wrestling to his advantage here. Um, and yeah, I think Hernandez is able to win a striking fight against Damon Jackson. Um, and I don't think this fight's gonna last very long. I think Jackson will shoot for takedowns early. I don't think he's gonna get it. I don't think he'll get the takedowns early and then he'll just kind of be a sitting duck on the feet for, Al for Alexander Hernandez. And then Hernandez will just start to dominate striking wise. That's what I think's gonna happen if I'm being honest with you. I'm um, taking Alexander Hernandez, who's going with the nickname The Great Ape to win the fight by uh, first shot knockout. Now again, say what you want about Hernandez. Is he the most likable guy? Eh, I don't know, again, He's most remembered for when he got checked by Donald Cerrone back in, what, 2020 now? I believe that was early 2020. Was it 2019? I think it was, I think it was 2020. I think. Um, 
on that first UFC on ESPN Plus card, right? So that's kind of what he's most known for. But Hernandez does have a decent striking game, right? Like he does actually have a win a long time ago over Benil Dariush. Go back to UFC 222 and uh, in 2018, where he beat Dariush by knockout in 42 seconds, and he tied that into a victory over two-time PFL champ Oliver Aben Mercier, who's now retired. But right, like two really good back-to-back -back wins. Just that cowboy fight happened. He got dominated by cowboy. And we have not seen the same Hernandez since. We still have not seen it. I don't think we're ever going to see it, if we're being honest. But I do think he's better than Damon Jackson striking-wise. And I think he's going to really put some punches in the head of Damon Jackson. And the power is going to be too much. Give me Alexander Hernandez to beat Damon Jackson by first round knockout. On to the main event. Again, we've talked about it before. It is the rematch in the middleweight division between Brendan All in Allen and Chris Curtis. Does anything change from the rematch? Or what has changed from the rematch, right? Chris Curtis, you know, after he beat Brendan Allen the first time, we were thinking, all right, well, you know, this dude's legit, right? He beat Phil Hawes, and that's before everyone kind of knew Phil Hawes' chin was horrible, right? So he knocks out Phil Hawes, he knocks out Brendan Allen, he beats Adolfo Vieira, and then he gets a co-main event spot on somewhat short notice against Jack Hermanson. He loses by decision, right? Chris Curtis thought Hermanson was running from him the entire fight. He really wasn't, but still, you know, Curtis isn't doesn't take losses, you know, most gracious way. He doesn't. Um, he doesn't take them all that graciously, but it's fine. He loses to Hermanson, right? Then he beats Joaquin Buckley. That was a great performance out of Chris Curtis. And that's a fight that needs that needs to like be studied in the Brendan Allen camp. It's like, yeah, Curtis, even though he has had some lackluster performances, he's still very good and he can still catch you. Right? And I'll talk about the first fight between Allen and Curtis in a second, right? Curtis loses to Kelvin Gaslam. Gaslam's all right, still, right? Has the fight against Nasser Yimimov, gets poked, or not poked, gets clash of heads, can't continue. Was Curtis looking for a way out? Eh, maybe, I don't know, because he was losing. He was going to be down 2 nothing going into that third, and he probably was going to lose the fight. Um, and then he beats Marc-Andre Berrio by split decision over in Canada. It's not a great fight. It's on the main card of a pay-per-view. Um, like, you look at it on paper, right? And you're thinking, okay, 140 to 122 in the significant strike count for Chris Curtis. That must have been an amazing fight. It really wasn't. The crowd was not into it at all. I thought Curtis won every single round. I don't know where you give Marc-Andre Berrio a round. I don't know. It was a, it was weird scorecards, right? So two judges had Curtis 30-27. And then Derek clearly had it 29-28 for Marc-Andre Berrio. Where does he win one round, let alone two? I guess maybe the second round's when you give him to Berrio. But where do you give him to? I don't know. I, I don't know where two rounds go to Marc-Andre Berrio on that fight. Um, so I thought Curtis did pretty well on that one. I, I think he did, right? He's still an all-around very good striker. Now, when you look at the first Brendan Allen, Chris Curtis fight, okay, Chris Curtis and Brendan Allen exchange so many times in that fight. It seems like Allen doesn't really respect Curtis all that much as a striker. I think maybe Allen looked at it like this is a guy who got washed out of the PFL. He went 0-3 in his last PFL season, right? We lost to Magomed, Magomed Karimov twice, loses and gets knocked out by Ray Cooper. Allen thought he was going to walk him down and knock him out. Didn't happen, right? And then you look at what, you know, Brent Allen looks for a couple takedowns. Curtis does a really good job at, at getting out of him. And that's what Chris Curtis does do very well. Chris Curtis dictates where fights ends up, ends up. Right? Like Jack Hermanson didn't really look to shoot much on Chris Curtis, but Chris Curtis at least got the fight where he wanted it to be, and that was on the feet. Hadolfo Vieira tried to get Chris Curtis down. I get Hadolfo Vieira is not the best wrestler. If he if he had bow nickel level wrestling, Hadolfo Vieira would be the world champion. I'm serious. Um, but obviously he doesn't have bow nickel level wrestling, right? But still, right, Chris Curtis stuffed, I think, 17 takedowns or like 19 takedowns against Hadolfo Vieira. That's what Chris Curtis does. He's a very good defensive wrestler who can keep fights standing and who can, you know, if he can win the striking exchanges, he's going to win the fight. Again, the Joaquin Buckley fight, tremendously timed. And again, I'll say it again, I don't know what happened. If Joaquin Buckley beat Vicente Luque, that one's only going to look better for Chris Curtis going into this week. I don't think he's going to, I don't think Buckley's going to beat Luque. Like that fight's happening tomorrow in, in New Jersey. I don't think that uh, Buckley's going to win the fight. But if he does, again, then Curtis beat that guy. Um, but when you look again at that first Curtis Brendan Allen fight, Chris Curtis wins the first round. He's a plus like 350 dog going into that fight. But every single time, Curtis catches him with the hook. Every single time Allen charges in, he gets caught. And he eats, he eats some big shots from Chris Curtis too. And I just think that's going to give Chris Curtis a lot of confidence going into the second fight because he's already beat this guy. Now, what has Brendan Allen done since that loss to Chris Curtis? And I'll talk about another factor going into this fight later. But right, 
He loses to Chris Curtis. He beats Sam Alvey. He should not have been there with Sam Alvey. Sam Alvey, why was he fighting Brendan Allen? I don't know. But he beats, Brendan Allen beats Sam Alvey at 205 of all places, right? Um, he beats Jacob Malkoon, wrestler, okay. He beats Christoph Jocko by submission. He out jujitsu's and out wrestles and out scrambles Andre Muniz. Muniz, tremendous victory. Credit to him. He chokes out Bruno Silva. Okay, Bruno Silva's a striker. And he just chokes out Paul Craig. Well, okay, Brendan Allen, all around stronger than Paul Craig. You know, Paul Craig was a sitting duck on the feet too, and Brendan Allen had superior wrestling. Those are guys Brendan Allen's supposed to beat. So I, I was looking at this fight, I'm like, is Brendan Allen's winning streak a little bit overrated here? Cause like, seriously, the guys he's beat, yeah, like Malkoon, but Malkoon and Muniz and Craig, but all that says is, okay, Brendan Allen's a good wrestler. Like, yeah, like Brendan Allen is a better wrestler than these guys. But what happens when he can't get a takedown against a guy like Chris Curtis? Because what happened in the first fight when, when he wasn't able to get a takedown against, against Chris Curtis? He lost. He got knocked out. Chris Curtis ends up boxing him up and finishing him in the, finishes, him, finishes him in the second round. Also, this is the third time that Extreme Couture has fought Brendan Allen. They've already fought him twice. Brendan Allen fought Sean Strickland. Sean Strickland beats Brendan Allen. He knocks him out in the second round. And then uh, Chris Curtis knocks out Brendan Allen as well. Extreme Couture is 2-0 against him. They know the game plan against Brendan Allen. You stuff the takedowns, you win the fight. Because when Brendan Allen fought Sean Strickland, and again, at that point in time, nobody thought Sean Strickland was going to become the hero that he is and the champion that he is and the fighter that he is at this point in time. Sure, but Sean Strickland outpaced Brendan Allen 2-1 in that fight. Like Again, Allen tried, didn't really try to wrestle. He thought he could go, go in there and walk down Sean Strickland and he was not successful. Strickland boxed his head in and eventually beat him in the second by knocking him out. I, again, I, I think it's just something in this fight where I don't think Brendan Allen's able to beat this camp. They beat him twice before. I think they're going to beat him again. I'm taking Chris Curtis. I'm taking Chris Curtis to beat Brendan Allen the same exact way he did last time. Chris Curtis second round knockout. That's the pick here. I'm taking the underdog. I'm taking plus 190 on Chris Curtis here. I just think matchup wise, style is good. This is a horrible fight for Brendan Allen. I think Marvin Vittori was a way better fight for him. Because if Chris Curtis was able to out-wrestle Marvin Vittori, he was going to win the fight, obviously, right? I don't think he can wrestle out-wrestle Chris Curtis. I might be putting too much into the def defensive wrestling game of Chris Curtis, but I'm going to bank on the fact that Brendan Allen's not able to take Curtis down. Don't think so. And I, think, I also think Brendan Allen thinks he can go out there and knock out Chris Curtis to prove a point. Not going to happen. It's hard to put away Chris Curtis. I know Ray Cooper did it, but Ray Cooper hits like a truck. And that was prime Ray Cooper back in 2018. 2019, 2018. I think it was, I think it was 2019. Um, was it 2019? Hmm. Might be 2018. It was 2019. Okay, right? But that's like prime Ray Cooper. Ray Cooper's not the same guy anymore, right? Like Jason Jackson just beat the crap out of him over in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, right? Chris Curtis's chin's still decent. He hasn't really been completely wobbled in a minute. Like Gaston hit him kind of hard, but still... No guy's been able to finish Chris Curtis since Ray Cooper the third. I think Chris Curtis is going to eat a lot of punches from Brendan Allen, but also, yeah, Brendan Allen's going to eat a lot of punches from Chris Curtis. And we will see if Brendan Allen truly respects the striking game of Curtis in this fight. But I just think matchup-wise, this is a horrible fight for Brendan Allen. It is a horrible rematch for him. And Chris Curtis is going to beat Brendan Allen. He's going to knock him out again in the second round, which is crazy because does Chris Curtis really deserve to be in the top five of the weight class? Well, if he beats Brendan Allen, sure. But this is going to catapult Chris Curtis if he wins from 14 all the way to five. I think he'll jump Vittori with the victory in this fight. He'll be the fifth ranked UFC middleweight if he beats Brendan Allen. Where does that put him next? I don't know because the state of the division, right? Whitaker's fighting Shemaev. It looks like Adesanya's fighting Duplessy. Strickland's likely, likely going to have to fight Cannoneer. I, I think Chris Curtis gets the Paulo Costa matchup in Brazil if he wants to turn around quickly. If not, do they match him up against Imavov again? That's probably what they do. He probably gets Nasu Imavov again if he doesn't get Costa. But maybe they give Strickland Costa, if I'm being honest. They might give Strickland Costa in Brazil. Or that fight, no, no, they're saying the fight's going to be on 302. I don't know. They might give Strickland the Costa fight, right? And then they'd give the winner of this fight, regardless if it's Curtis or Allen, either Vittori, yeah, or um, Cannoneer. Because Cannoneer needs a fight. Like, I, what are we doing with Jared Cannoneer? I know he's coming off post-surgery and whatnot, but still, like, Cannoneer is being slept on in this weight class incredibly. He's getting up there in age. It's make or break time for Jared Cannoneer in terms of the world championship. But in this fight, 
I'm going with the action man. We're taking Chris Curtis to go out there and beat Brennan Allen. I think he knocks him out in the second round. I just think, again, he's able to keep the fight standing. I think the defensive wrestling does a lot for Chris Curtis in this fight. And he ends up knocking out Brennan Allen and just finding a way. I think he hits too hard for him. And I think he's going to check him a bunch of times. <clears throat> he's going to check him a bunch of times with the hooks. And it's going to be trouble for Brennan Allen. I think, again, it's a horrible stylistic matchup. It's a horrible rematch on short notice. I think, again, Vittori was the much easier matchup for him. But Chris Curtis is going to do the job here. And the action man, Chris Curtis, notches his best victory to date. Chris Curtis, the action man, knocks out Brennan Allen in the second round and wins the fight in the main event. So, folks, thank you all for watching our UFC Fight Night predictions here with Brendan Allen and Chris Curtis in the main event. We'll be back next week for UFC 300. Yes, UFC 300. That's a, you know, say what you want about the card. Like, was it hyped up? Yes, but it's still a very good fight card. And then, of course, tomorrow we will have PFL predictions as well. You got the heavyweights and the women's flyweights. It's a card. It's interesting, right? Ante Delia versus uh, Moldovsky in the main event. Dennis Goltsov, Linton, Linton Vassal, Liz Carmouche, and Juliana Velasquez is going to fight again. Uh, Do Dakota DeChiva is in the card. Blagoy Ivanov makes his PFL debut for the first time he's fought for that World Series of Fighting slash PFL banner since, what, 2018, 2017. So it's going to be a card. Join us tomorrow, folks, for that. Folks, thank you for watching. Make sure, that's, hey, make sure to hit that subscribe button down below for more. Make sure to leave a like if you did enjoy the video. Make sure to comment if you do disagree with any of the picks. Folks, thank you for watching. And Mamba, forever.